Hello, I'm Stephen Burchard, and I'm an associate producer for Veterans Voices. Welcome to our best of 2022 show. Tonight, we'll be celebrating some of our most memorable moments from the show this year. In our January show, we had a discussion about shadow boxes and the idea of displaying your service. And I had a chance to catch up with some veterans on the bay in our A Vet on the Street segment. Please enjoy. Now, for me, if you think about uh, what a shadow is for all of us, it's kind of like this opaque, empty representation of all of us. And, um, and for a lot of us, when we leave the military, that's exactly what it feels like, um, empty. And, and, uh, and, and no longer filled with all the things that made you feel complete. In my case, as a Marine who, was, uh, who had to get separated due to uh, an injury that uh, wasn't combat related or anything like that. Um, but those shadow boxes fill those shadows. They fill the void that's left by leaving service and that identity. Me and a friend of mine were always the ones to make them for others. Uh, so everybody would joke around, who's going to make yours when you retire? So uh, uh, Shane McGinty and uh, a master sergeant that had worked for me, uh, Brian Posey and a staff sergeant Zinkovich uh, that worked for me, uh, all snuck around behind my back and built this uh, retirement table for me. And since I have a shop right behind my home that, that Shane and I do some work out of, they were actually, while I was at work, kind of sneaking around in the shop, uh, working on this shadow box and this table for me. And to surprise me with it, I didn't think it was possible that they could pull that over uh, on me. <laughs> and that they even uh, roped my wife into it and had, uh, had her go out and turn a camera I had on the shop uh, away where I couldn't see them bringing stuff in and out. And uh, so at my retirement ceremony here just uh, about two weeks ago, uh, you know, I thought maybe there would be, be a plaque or something like that, but they come carrying this table in, and I was completely blown away. I'm Stephen Burchick, and we're here today with the segment Vet on the Street. The question is, do you have a shadow box, and why or why not? In the background, you can see the ship will be boarding shortly, the John A.B. Dillard, operated by the Army Corps of Engineers. It's a great day for a sail. Welcome aboard. My name is Kixon Meyer, and I'm the, I'm the captain. I'm a retired Coast Guard warrant officer, and I've had this job for about 11 years. And today our mission was uh, taking a group of vets out and showing them the bay. Uh, the, it's, a, it's a great mission for this vessel because of the, the legacy of it, the John A.B. Dillard, Jr. Uh, he was the highest ranking officer to lose his life at the time in Vietnam. Steve Mazaika, Army. 1966-67 in Vietnam, sergeant in uh, 4th Aviation, 4th Infantry Division, and I do not have a shadow box. Uh, yes, I have uh, considered one. It, I just have to get all the things together to put in it. My name is uh, Donnie Candelario. I served six years in the Airborne. No, I don't, and I don't know why I never got around to it. This is Jim Hill, who served in the U.S. Army. He was in Vietnam in 1966 and uh, was with the 25th Infantry Division. I do have a shadow box. Uh, it was a uh, something that I deferred for a long time and then uh, put it together, and I'm real happy that I did. It turned out great. small box. <laughs>
Uh, Mike Weber served in the Army uh, uh, as an Army medic in, in Pleiku, Vietnam, 67, 68. I do not have a shadow box, but I've got a, a little military statue from the All Wars Memorial with my dog tags wrapped around it and uh, such as that. So that's my military display at home. Hi, my name is Sam Capps. I was in the Army from 1965 to 67, and I was stationed at Letterman General Hospital in the Presidio, San Francisco. I do not have a shadow box. I have just never thought about making one of those, but maybe I will. Hi, I'm Jim Murphy, U.S. Navy. I served uh, 1968 through 1972 uh, throughout uh, the uh, Far East, Westpac, and uh, Vietnam. Uh, I do not have a shadow box. I, uh, I know what a shadow box is, but I, I do not have a shadow box and uh, never really considered having one, so it, it's not been part of what I've uh, ever planned to do with my medals or citations. My, uh, my medals I keep in a uh, special box with other personal memorabilia that I will someday pass on to my grandchildren. I'm Frederick Granados and I served in Vietnam in 1967-68 during the uh, Tet Offensive. Um, do I have a, a shadow box? No. But what I do have is my uniform on display at the Vietnam Veterans Building with all my uh, paraphernalia and ribbons of valor. Hello, I'm Noga Kessler. I am an associate producer for Veterans Voices. In February, we talked with veterans about spending time in the great outdoors. And in addition, I had a great conversation with Navy Corpsman Kristen Cassidy. Our outdoor areas, and some of you have been working with some of our national parks, and some of you have just explored our nation by hiking up and down trails. Chief, get us started in helping our audience understand a little bit about how you interface with veterans in our great outdoors. So I've got a client list that includes guys with no limbs, uh, guys in wheelchairs with paralysis, uh, and guys that's got a no physical injuries, but they've got internal trauma, what we call the moral wounds of war. And uh, I started a program in 2010 called Tier 1 Tranquility Base to try and knock down some of the suicides that are going on. And uh, we use the national park system up here because I live near Yosemite. Uh, but there's something about going up there and uh, nature takes all the stress out. And we get to sit down on the rocks or by the waterfalls or in the middle of the Mariposa Grove of redwood trees and uh, nature just sucks the stress out of you. And then after about three days, we, uh, we teach them how to breathe and, and then we start talking about what's really wrong. How much of it's PTSD? How much of it's the demons in your closet that you're trying to keep in there? Um, so that's, that's the short version of what goes on at Tier 1. But we use the outdoors specifically because uh, it's a, a primal mm -hmm. healing thing. Uh, Awani uh, Hotel up inside the park was used all the way back to the Civil War for what they called then shell shock, uh, what we now call PTSD. Uh, so Yosemite's got a long, long history of helping veterans heal. So we've got some pictures that'll go along with a lot of what you're describing. You're saying veteran stress just goes away and you teach them how to breathe. What is the typical experience for a veteran when they come into this type of experience? Are they usually very guarded, unsure, uncertain? How so, do they initially respond to the idea that you're going to take them out in the, in the wilderness and help them get through this, either uh, Chief or Jed or any Jay? Go ahead, guys. I'll, I'll sit back and wait. Go ahead. Well, I, yeah, so I, I saw a picture of myself pop up there when uh, hiking in Arizona and then the bike trip that I did. But for me, the outdoors has been been really great for me because after I did a long Army career, 30 years, retired in 2017, and I kind of missed that sense of adventure that I got every day, every month from the Army. I had a lot of freedom. So for me personally, I, I linked up with an organization called Warrior Expeditions, and was able to do a, a solo long distance hike from Mexico to Utah on the Arizona Trail. And then this past summer, I did a, a cross country bike trip on the Great American Rail Trail on, on a bicycle. And so for me, it was it was a blending of being outdoors, of course, a lot of alone time, you know, you're doing this by yourself. 
So you, know, you have to rely on yourself and the traits that we learned in the military. But also, if you wanted to be around people, uh, there's lots of people out there that you can find, whether it's um, people in the parks or people in small town America, and, and people will help you um, whether you want them to or not. But certainly if you ask for help, uh, a lot of people will help you out. And that was what I found very refreshing that there are so many Americans that want to help you on your journey. For me, being 18 years old and never being far from home, it was a huge shock to me. Uh, the boot camp was a huge shock. I mean, by the time you get to your C school is what they call it when you're training to become a Navy corpsman, you've adjusted a bit. And of course, I had to go to, um, after I became a corpsman, I went to the Naval Medical Center and then went to field corps, uh, field medical school, which was you know, Marine Corps level training, which is different, more intense. Um, once you get the, I always thought it was kind of a game. Once you get the game, what they want, um, it was really quite easy for me. Um, I really enjoyed the camaraderie in um, training and in the schools. And um, it's a huge adjustment, but if you're able to make that adjustment, it's so worth it. So if you could uh, maybe uh, pick out uh, maybe one or two uh, stories or, or experiences that, that kind of really stuck with you. and There's a lot of stories and a lot of emotion behind different stories. Um, I, for a fun story, I went out with... Um, Staff Sergeant Clark's um, convoy uh, going, um, I think we we're going up to Tecrete to bring some supplies. Um, and he, you know, I was in the back of the Humvee. I was always in the scout vehicle with the big wigs. They wanted to keep me safe, which I totally appreciated. And um, we just went out and we had to also, um, check to see if there was an IED on the side of the road and staff Sergeant Clark wanted to go out without his protective gear because that's something that he had done before and, um, had been safe in doing that before. However, being a corpsman, it's my job to ensure that I don't have to go to work if I don't need to, right. They need to wear their protective gear. There's a reason to wear that. And as I approached him, you know, I got, he, he was really lovely. He always kind of would say I was like his sister's kids, always nagging him to do things. And, um, it ended up exploding and he ended up being okay. And, um, he really took that time to tell me how valuable it was that I stopped him me being a, you know, 19 year old girl to this 30 plus staff sergeant. And he um, really, really just thanked me for that. He since did end up passing during that deployment. Um, but that is something that I will hold with me for the rest of my life. Hello, I'm Crystal Kane and I'm the social media manager for Veterans Voices. In our March show, we talked with former prisoners of war, and correspondent Stephen Burchick had an in-depth conversation with Marine veteran Lee Halverson in our Veterans Voices segment. We felt it appropriate to start this show with a ceremony presented by Marine veteran Mike Federson from the Vietnam Veterans of Diablo Valley. There seems to be a phrase that resonates throughout those who served in our nation's military, and that is that all gave some, and some gave all. And to those who have served and those that are currently serving in the uniformed services of the United States are ever mindful that the sweetness of enduring peace has always been tainted by the bitterness of personal sacrifice. We are compelled to never forget that while we enjoy our daily pleasures, there are those who have endured and still may be enduring the agonies of pain, deprivation, and imprisonment. We pause to recognize those that are still considered as prisoners of war, to those who are missing, and to those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice to ensure our nation's freedom. I would like to direct your attention to this small table that 
occupies a place of dignity and honor. It is a setting for one symbolizing the fact that members of our armed services are missing from our ranks. We call them comrades. They are unable to be with their loved ones and their families. And so we join together to pay humble tribute to them and bear witness to their continued absence. And as you look upon this table, you'll notice that the tablecloth is white, which is symbolic of the purity of their intentions to respond to our country's call to arms. The single red rose that is in the vase reminds us of the blood that they may have shed while enduring peace for our beloved United States of America. The red rose also reminds us of the friends and families who keep the faith while awaiting their return. The yellow ribbon that is tied around the vase reminds us of the yellow ribbons that are worn on the lapels of thousands who demand with unyielding determination a proper account of our missing comrades who are not among us. There is a slice of lemon that is on the plate that reminds us of their bitter fate. The sprinkle of salt reminds us of the countless volunteers of the families as they wait. The wine glass is inverted, for they cannot toast us at this time, and the chair is empty, for they are not here. The single lighted candle is reminiscent of the light of hope that lives in our hearts, illuminating their way home from their captors to the open arms of a grateful nation. And the American flag reminds us that many of them may never return and who have paid the supreme sacrifice to ensure our freedom. So let us pray to the supreme commander that all of our comrades will soon be within our ranks. And let us remember and never forget their sacrifices and may God watch over them and their families. God bless America and God bless the men and women who have served and those that are currently serving in the uniformed services of these United States of America. I'm Steve Burchick with Veterans Voices, and this segment is A Veteran's Voice. Uh, we're filming here in the Veterans Memorial Building in Danville, and our guest today is Lee Halverson. Welcome, Lee. Thank you, Steve. Good to be here. Uh, can you briefly describe your military career? understand it was uh, actually kind of a long one. It was, it was. I originally planned on just enlisting and coming out and doing something else, but uh, coming out of high school, I wasn't really prepared for college, so I decided to enlist in the Marine Corps. Vietnam was just starting up, and they said, there's a good chance you're going. I says, okay. So I was off uh, within the week down to uh, San Diego for Marine training. Uh, completed that in December of uh, that year. Uh, they sent me home for Christmas. I went back for training in uh, January and they uh, sent me to on the job training as a food service technician or cook uh, for uh, two months there at the mess hall there. And then we uh, loaded up the ship and had a slow boat to uh, Vietnam. Arriving in Vietnam, I was assigned to 1st Battalion, 9th Marines, 3rd Marine Division. On my way out, I went by the career planner to see what he could do for me about sticking around another week or so. And he says, well, I can't do that, but how would you like a new job? And hence, I went into the uh, weather service. I uh, went to school up in Lakehurst, uh, six-month school. Went to Warren Officer School and came out and went immediately to Korea for a tour, uh, at which we did one short uh, tour down in uh, one short visit down in, in uh, not to Korea, to Iwakuni, Japan, of which we did a, a couple week visit down to uh, on Team Spirit exercise. Uh, and the rest of the time was kind of downhill. Uh, once I got uh, into warrant officer, after two or three years, I was eligible to put in for what we call a limited duty officer that you stay technical, but you pick up first lieutenant. Okay. And I actually ended up retiring as a captain uh, after 23 and a half years. Well, Lee, after you left the Marines, uh, what was your civilian life like? What kind of path did you follow? Well, I decided to go back to school so I could get a job in environmental protection. So I went over to Cal State Hayward uh, for two years uh, doing a BS in uh, geology and then two years of uh, grad school in geochemistry. Uh, during that period, I was offered a job by uh, California EPA Department of Toxics. We do uh, hazardous waste management oversight in the state of California. I did uh, 10 years with them. Uh, my last six years was household hazardous waste management for the state of California. 
Lee, how long have you been a volunteer at the Veterans Building and how did you get started? I joined the VFW in 89 when I retired from the Marines and over the years uh, we decided that the building was kind of getting dilapidated. Uh, we had uh, two organizations using it, uh, the uh, Viet VFW and the uh, American Legion. Uh, they had one room to meet in upstairs and occasionally did a fundraiser down in the big auditorium, but the building was getting dilapidated. We decided that uh, we needed to do something about that, so we looked around for a new location. Uh, didn't work out. We couldn't afford to build a new place and buy a new uh, ground for it, so we decided to work with the town of Danville and fund a uh, refurbishment of this building here. Uh, it took us about two years once we got started. While we were fundraising, uh, we got kicked off and broke ground in 2010 and uh, reopened it in 2012 in April. We have in our 10th anniversary this April. Okay, looking forward to that. Uh -huh. I'm Chris Verdugo, and I'm the director for Veterans Voices. We are very proud to have in-depth conversations about veterans issues that you won't see anywhere else on television. In our April show, we talked with Native American veterans about their experiences in the military. So we want to start this conversation off from hearing from those who served in our military and are from a Native American background. There's a lot to learn uh, from your experiences. Thurman, why don't you get us started and, and just share with us real quickly the journey of you joining the Army. Well, I volunteered. I was in our uh, regular Army and I spent three years and my first tour was in Vietnam. My second tour was with the Berlin Brigade in Germany. And it was hard getting off the reservation you know, because I've lived there for so long. And at 19, when I got out of high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I start looking around and I said, well, the army's gonna help me. So that's why I joined. I can relate to that. Growing up in a small town, there wasn't a lot of opportunity. And I would imagine maybe growing up on a reservation, you were faced <laughs> with the same challenge. Yeah, I did have the same challenge. We only had one car. You know, my mother went to work in that. My father raised uh, cattle and, you know, we did that. And uh, so I was able to get into town a little bit more than uh, some of the others because my mother worked in town at the hospital. So I got to mix with a few more different types of people, but the Army really showed me how diverse it was because then I start running into blacks, Puerto Ricans, you know, a whole uh, combination of people, which was, you know, kind of hard if you're just used to one type of person, you, you know, Indians and whites, you know, it's kind of hard, you know, right. to mix with the others. Yeah, and it seems like you can relate to that. Yeah, I understand what he means, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious, uh, where are you from? Uh, I'm from uh, Brincon Indian Reservation down in San Diego County. Nice to meet you. So. Yeah. yeah. Nice to meet I'm, you too. I'm an enrolled band member of the Mohawks of Ganawage, which is in uh, um, Mohawk territory, which I'm from the Canadian side, so First Nations. Oh, okay. And um, I served. Uh, in the Royal Canadian Navy, and I also served in the U.S. Army uh, mm -hmm. as a helicopter crew chief on Hueys and Blackhawks. Oh, and wow. um, I was deployed to uh, Kuwait during the first Gulf War and then the the Civil War in Bosnia. So, that's right. yeah. and I'm the first female in my family uh, to go in the military. It was more of a a male thing, so I kind of mm -hmm. broke the the pattern. <laughs> I'm sure well, you. Well, that's imagine. good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kevin, what about you? Yeah. Um, anyway, I was uh, I was in the in in the Air Force. I enlisted in the Air Force because at the time I was in there between '66 and then '70, uh, mm -hmm. and the draft was real big, and people were getting drafted left and right, and I wanted a little bit of a voice and what I was going to do rather than than just being told this is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I grew up what I call an urban reservation, which is a farm labor camp. Mm -hmm. And my ethnic uh, cultural uh, uh, background was kept a secret from me because 
they felt that I could be more successful if I didn't put it out there, mm. uh, you know, as I was going going to school. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah. it gave me the opportunity being this, this is in Contra Costa, I actually, uh, I, I, I come from, Con- I grew up in Contra Costa in a little town called Brentwood, which was a farming community. Now it's a commuter community. So it was all farm labor work there. And my parents were farm labor workers. Mm. And uh, and that actually is is by enlisting. It gave me the opportunity to get out of there. Or if not, I'd probably still be there uh, and and see see things. You know, I spent time in Japan, spent time in Southeast Asia, the majority uh, a full year right on the Thai uh, Laotian border with the Air mm. Commando unit there. So uh, it was a very secret base, mm. and uh, mm-hmm. uh, all the planes were not marked or, or, or so. Uh, um, a lot of my 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 time was spent there, and then and then when I got out, I took advantage of the GI Bill, mm-hmm. which uh, allowed me to go to school, mm-hmm. and that was a very very important thing because I went to school, and this time I buckled down and actually studied and went to classes, and. Uh, and got and then then got my teaching credential, got a master's degree, mm. and I worked with uh, uh, at-risk kids for uh, 40 years. Mm. So, wow. and, mm. and I still, you know, still do a lot of stuff with the at-risk, the at-risk kids. But uh, through that process, I started getting really involved with uh, different Native groups, and mm. really learned more about myself and my culture. And uh, mm. and that was uh, um, I really didn't talk much about the military. You know, the, to me, this is a healing moment because yes. uh, I waited all those years where I was working and didn't talk about my time in the military. Then people would try and pry it out of me and I wouldn't say anything, you know, and uh, because I didn't, you know, they didn't need to know those things. Right. Yeah. This is a he- very healing moment for me. That's mm-hmm. the way I felt. You know, mm-hmm. I didn't let people know I was a Vietnam vet until about 15 years after I worked for the phone company, then I start talking about it. But all that time, I just never said anything about it. Mm-hmm. And they never asked me, so I didn't, you know, it didn't bother me. I'm so pleased to bring Chris and Jamie Luttrell to the studio today for our A Veterans Voice segment. I'm Doc Shauna Springer, and I'm going to be talking with them a little bit about their relationship and how they came to launch the Gravity Podcast. Chris is a military veteran of the United States Air Force. Chris, tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, Doc Springer, thanks for having us tonight. Uh, Yeah, I joined the Air Force in 1999 and became a security forces member. I spent a year in Korea, and then we got stationed at McCord Air Force Base in Tacoma, Washington. From there, I deployed to Iraq for Operation uh, Enduring Freedom, and then uh, separated from the military in 2005 and became a civilian police officer in Washington State. Okay. And Jamie, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you come into the story of the Chris and Jamie Luttrell Gravity Podcast? Funny you say it like that. We used to have just a thing between us where we'd go the Chris and Jamie show. But yeah, Uh, for years, we've talked about these conversations that are important in marriage and uh, decisions and choices in marriage. Hard, easy, funny, funny stories. And then it has turned into this podcast. It was destined to be, I mean, I've listened to the podcast. I've listened to Marriage Mondays. Um, You guys go back. I mean, when Chris says we were stationed, you were with him from a very young age. I was. We got married when we were 19. So um, started dating before that. We did. I tricked her into dating when I was 16. So, (laughs) yep, he did trick me into dating him. And here we are. Um, All right. So tell us about what led you guys to launch the Gravity podcast. Yeah, you know, throughout uh, both COVID and just the political unrest of the last couple of years, we really saw this this polarizing effect in in our community, amongst our friends. Hello, my name is Ray Alvarado, and I'm the coordinating producer for Veterans Voices. Veterans Voices is dedicated to having an open and honest dialogue about veterans issues. In our May show, we talked about veterans and social isolation. We had a fantastic first segment, but now I want to welcome Jeff Jewell, the former director of the Concord Vet Center, and Harry Hitchings. We call him Hitch. He's the veteran service officer from Modoc County. Welcome, gentlemen, to the show. Thank you for having me, Nathan. Simple fun. All right. Yeah, glad glad to be here, Nathan. 
Uh, great to see you again. Good to see you both as well. I've known and worked with you for several years. Both of you are veterans, Air Force and Marine Corps, but I want to I want to get your perspective not only as veterans cuz I think you can relate to the topics that were discussed in segment 1, but a lot of uh, a lot of um difficulty in finding something that was relevant and significant, uh, a lot of difficulty in, in relating to others, a lot of feelings of loss and guilt in regards to being left uh, or, or feeling like you left others, and an overall hope that we could find a new path uh, in this transition out of the military. Gentlemen, how can you pick up in this conversation from your perspectives? Um, uh, Hitch, is it all right if I go first? Uh, go right just, ahead. Yeah, I jump in there anytime. Um, you know, I just wanted to, to uh, you know, listening to these two, uh, Jet and Michael, uh, one of the things that I really think they, they we need to talk about a little bit is what are some of these challenges that the veterans face when they come back, you know, uh, that, that helps them to perpetuate, you know, this, this whole feeling of uh, being isolated, you know. Um, and one of the things we have to really recognize is that, you know, um, uh, and and I think every veteran out there should, should know this, is that, you know, that uh, veterans view the world differently because of their experiences, and especially if they're combat veterans. Um, and they have a different view of the world than they had before they went in. And then when they come back and everybody wants everything to be normal again, they're going, wait a minute, you know, uh, you know, what is normal? Um, and so they have all these questions, you know, um, and they have a difficult time uh, managing their expectations, uh, hard time letting themselves feel. Uh, you know, I, I used, when I was a therapist at the Concord Vet Center and in, in Sacramento and in Oakland, I, I would always, you know, hear things like, you know, I am having a hard time letting myself feel. I'm having a hard time connecting with old friends. Um, I don't have anything in common with them anymore. Uh, what should I do today? Uh, you know, uh, how do I survive? So many people take for granted that those who serve our country deserve to be citizens, but that is not always the case. In our June show, we explored using service as a pathway to becoming a U.S. citizen. Casey, I want to jump to you because what I understand from you, sir, is that you actually became a U.S. citizen during your leave from, was it Vietnam? Yeah, uh, from r and in Hawaii, I got my citizenship. Uh, my paperwork was started uh, when I joined the Navy. As a, a, First of all, I had the green card and I was eligible for a draft, so I had a draft I got drafted, but I was able to get into the Navy in a six month delay program to get my citizenship before I actually started boot camp so I could go to a nuclear power school. Because as a Japanese citizen, I'm not eligible to go become an electronics tech or go to nuclear power school. So thinking that the six months <laughs> is enough time, but it doesn't work that way. So. I left for a bit, even in San Diego, when I was stationed there before going to Vietnam, I couldn't get the government to move on it. I finally got my uncle that was a retired Navy captain. He knew who to call and who to push buttons. So after I got to Vietnam, I got a call, a letter from him saying that the paperwork could be ready in Hawaii. And I'm thinking that, you know, if I didn't have an uh, uncle that had a lot of pull, I probably would not get my citizenship. So, but it, said I got my citizenship. I was on r in Hawaii. And of course, because citizenship didn't come through in time, I ended up in Vietnam. <laughs> as a, a brown water navy all the way into cambodia from da nang to cambodia so uh, uh, it, by that time i already had my son was born before i even went in the navy and 
so it's like, okay, I don't know what I'm going to do with all this, but I'm glad to be an American citizen because for me, I was born in Nagasaki, Japan, right after the bomb. I was probably only a half breed in the Nagasaki area and I was not treated very well. And so for me to come to the America and except for the first, I, I would say about a month or so after I got here, for most part, I was very accepted into the Bay Area. Uh, so I felt like home. So I wanted to be an American because I feel I had a wife and a son. That's an American. I needed to be an American. <laughs> so. Yeah, absolutely. A lot happened for you in that time. Your son being born, being deployed to Vietnam, and then becoming a U.S. citizen in Hawaii, which is a pretty remarkable place to probably yes. have that ceremony or have that event take place. The mysterious world of the submariner has always been a fabled area of service. In our July show, we dove into the world of the submariner. And I also got to talk with Navy veteran Jim Murphy in our A Veteran's Voice segment. Ask you, did you often know where you were going? Or do you often know where you were or what you were doing out there? Well, yeah, on, on a couple of boats I served on, we actually had a chart on the mess decks. And the quartermaster would come down, stick little pins in it. And but it had to be kind of a, a vague <laughs> GPS. Let me use that expression because technically and, and security wise, we weren't supposed to know where we were going. But if you didn't know where we were going, just by the the uh, the compass heading, then you were some kind of a blithering idiot. That's for sure. <laughs> now that is, becomes your specialty. Qualifying is one thing, then you have your specialty job. I see. So and you're supposed to be very good at that. So, gents, let's open it up to the rest of the panel a little bit about your experiences of why you chose, and, and, and I, th I believe it's Submariner, but I've heard different versions of that. Yeah. So, correct me if I'm wrong, but what would make someone, what would make you, uh, our panel tonight, want to choose such an elite? a uh, very difficult, strenuous, uh, challenging, and very small part of the Navy. Can I start out? Yeah, go, please. Okay. okay. Um, when, when I was in high school, uh, Vietnam was in full bore, and I was really getting tired of school. I didn't want to go to college, and I decided that rather than to be drafted, I wanted to go ahead and join the Navy, made my own call. And through basic training, um, up in the beginning of the class on one of the training sessions that we had, the the instructor said, who would like to volunteer for submarine service? And I raised my hand and I thought, well, yeah, I think I can do that. And uh, quite personally, I think it was probably the best thing that I ever did for myself, um, bar none. Can you tell us a little bit about your military experience? Uh, I served in the U.S. Navy uh, four years, right to the date. Uh, served between 1968 and 1972. Um, I joined the service uh, uh, out of the result of being uh, A1 in the draft, I wanted to have control my own choices. The Navy seemed like a good operation to be a part of. And um, when I recruited with the recruiter, uh, I had a, a little bit of a background in art, some art school training. And one of the things that enticed me about the Navy is that they had a rating called Illustrator Draftsman that I was very interested in and the recruiter promised me that that would be an excellent choice for me. So after taking a series of battery tests and qualifying, uh, I signed the papers and uh, went into the Navy and spent four years there. Okay, and uh, you said there was a, a little bit of irony as you were exiting the Navy? Yeah, I, uh, I, I got in the Navy and uh, what I found out was that uh, I wanted to be an illustrator draftsman only to find out once I was in boot camp that that uh, particular rating uh, was closed. And so they felt that I was a good candidate to become uh, an electrician in the Navy. 
I didn't know anything about electricity, although my father was an electrician by uh, trade. And so uh, I struck for electrician and became an electrician's mate in the Navy. Uh, upon my release of the Navy and my exit uh, interview uh, from the service for separation, the officer who interviewed me told me that it was good I was getting out of the Navy because I had no future as an electrician because my mechanical aptitude score was so low. And then he asked me point blank, uh, how come you never struck for illustrator draftsman? Now this is four years later. And I told him my story and he said, yeah, well, they, they, you should have been an illustrator draftsman. And he said, good luck in civilian life. And that's where I left. In our August show, we talked with medics, corpsmen, and doctors. Nathan Johnson had a great interview with the Secretary of the California Department of Veterans Affairs, Vito Imbasiani. And Stephen Burchick was our vet on the street. Dr. Vito, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, Nathan. Great to be here. So you served as a doctor in the military. Give us a brief history of your military service. Well, I come from a very military family. I was born at West Point. I worked there during summers in high school and college. Um, I uh, wound up being a resident in surgery and urology at Yale and training partly at the West Haven VA Hospital. And I took a presidential commission as an intern in 1986 while I was at Yale. That meant the Army never paid for a single day of my education and I promised to serve at least seven years. Well, that promise grew into a 27 year um, commitment, uh, multiple deployments on active duty, the rest of the time as a reservist or since 9-11, 10 years as the state surgeon of the California Army National Guard. Well, what a remarkable career. And I can tell that you have been directly involved in saving lives, not only on the battlefield, but helping our service members transition home successfully. Now you've shared a really remarkable story before that I've heard, but I'd like our audience to hear it. I was sent to um, a wonderful hospital in Saudi Arabia, south of Kuwait by a few miles, so very close to the action. It was King Abdul Aziz Hospital located on what we would call the Air Force Academy of the Saudi uh, military. And because I was a young captain uh, and everyone else, all the other doctors and nurses were full bird colonels who had served in Vietnam, well, they took the day shift and at night, I was uh, the only doctor in this gigantic 400 bed hospital, uh, along with four army medics. And we were watching television when the alert came out at nine o'clock on the night of February 26th, 1991, that uh, the Scud missiles had been launched from Kuwait and were coming right at our air base. So of course, I, me and the four army medics go downstairs, put our gas mask on, a few minutes later, we feel the ground shake. We didn't know whether it was the Patriot missiles or the Scud missiles, but after the all clear, we come up and it turned out that uh, two, two Scud missiles were shot out of the sky by our Patriot missiles, but one of them unfortunately fell out of the sky, came down, pierced the roof of a building that housed an entire unit of Pennsylvania reservists who had only arrived in theater that very day. A few minutes later, Saudi ambulances started arriving because that blast site was a mile away and ambulance after ambulance started arriving. And the first to come into the emergency room were these soldiers completely covered in black dust and smoke. You've all seen those Keystone Cop movies or Three Stooges movies where the pie explodes in somebody's face and they get all black. I had to dust off the soot on the uniform and I saw the subdued American um, flag and I realized that these casualties and they were definitely deceased, um, they were American soldiers. And I went, holy Moses, I personally pronounced dead one fifth of all the American casualties of an entire war in the space of 90 minutes on that February 26th night. That must have been very difficult to be a, such a young doctor and handle such a incredibly traumatic event, trying to save as many lives as possible. I honor you for that service. 
In addition to the challenges you faced in combat, from what I understand, doctors face other unique challenges as well in their service in the military. I had to be more than a doctor. I, I, I had to stop the bleeding and call in the helicopters. That was my job description. But for example, on, the, on my forward operating base, we had two army, 200 army MPs and 800 Marines. And I had this one guy who went out for five days in a row in a tracked vehicle um, and uh, uh, it was destroyed by an IED each time. So five days in a row. And he came into sick bay and he'd have that haunted look in his eye that we all know so well. And, and the question, you know, like, hey, doc, why am I still alive? I mean, how many times do I have to, it's like Russian roulette, they feel. How many times do I have to do that before my luck runs out? And, uh, you know, I'm a surgeon. I, I, I fix things with a scalpel and stitches, but that, that guy got a hug, a long yeah. hug, and that's what he needed. Well, Dr. Vito, thank you so much for your time today. I continue to be very inspired and honored uh, to be in your presence and, and learn about your military service. And I thank you, sir, for your time as a doctor in, in the military and for the lives that you saved. So thank you. Uh Thank you, Nathan, and thanks for all you do for the veterans in your home county and for all the veterans in California. Thanks. My honor. Now, let's hear from our vet on the street, Stephen Burchick, as he asks veterans about their experiences with corpsmen and medics. I'm Steve Burchick, and our segment today is Vet on the Street. In the background, you can see the 4th of July parade here in Danville. Our question is, when you were in the service, were you ever assisted by a medic or a corpsman. My name is John Trujillo. I served in Vietnam in 1967-68. On August uh, 5th, 1967, uh, I was back uh, to Cameron Bay with first and second degree burns from JP4, uh, from an LZ uh, in uh, the Central Highlands. I was treated uh, extremely well. The medics uh, were quick into uh, getting aid to me and getting a helicopter to uh, evacuate me to the hospital. Yeah, I was personally not involved with any corpsman in the military service other than at the hospital, but my uncle, Joey Ott, was a corpsman, petty officer second class in the Navy, and he was attached to the Marines, and he uh, participated in the invasion at Iwo Jima during World War II. Yes, uh, yes, my uncle, he made it back. He's from Philadelphia, I'm from Philadelphia, and he uh, survived, and no, no injuries or wounds, and he lived a long life in the city. I, I was wounded twice in Vietnam. I was at the 198th Light Infantry. Our medic was Lonnie Hines, and the same medic tra treated me both times, and I was medevaced out both times. I was out in the Quezon Valley, uh, 1967, November the 7th, and I had a bunch of guys wounded out there, and the medics came to our rescue. One helicopter pilot that I really will never forget, <coughs> Pat Brady, who flew the medevac, the, uh, one of my troopers was asking me, he said, sir, do you think I'm going to make it out of here. I said, you're damn right you are. You see that, hear that whop, whop, whop? I said, that's the medics coming to, that's the angels from heaven. They're coming to get you out of here. You're gonna make it, buddy. Don't worry about it. Mike Weber, U.S. Army medic, uh, Viet, play coup Vietnam, 67, 68. Memorable event was a chopper came in with wounded guys, uh, one of which was laying on his stomach on the litter because his feet were, were amputated. His feet were all tangled up and, and torn up. Uh, we pulled him out of the helicopter and headed for the emergency room with him uh, uh, on the litter. And the young man, he saw where we were heading into this Quonset hut where the doctors were. And he said, hold it guys, hold up, hold up, hold up. He says, just a minute. He says, they're, they're not gonna let me smoke in there, are they? And I said, no, sir, they're not. They're not gonna let you smoke in that hospital. And he says, well, hold up then. I wanna have a smoke before we go in. And this is a man whose feet, both feet were detached from his body. Uh, so I guess that's a testimony for morphine because uh, he wasn't feeling a thing. Often we 
we have special shows that examine current events that are important to veterans. This year, the passage of the PACT Act was the perfect topic for our September show. And we'll start tonight's first segment with a conversation more about the burn pits, those who served in the Middle East. And I know that at least in the 20 years that I've been helping veterans, I've been very aware of how Desert Storm veterans were exposed to burning oil wells and Gulf War syndrome has significantly affected many of those veterans. And then as we went on, vets who served in Iraq and Afghanistan, we know they were exposed to toxic uh, chemicals through burn pits and even some of the uh, yellow cake radiation waste from uh, Al Tawitha uh, nuclear test facility. But the PACT Act specifically has outlined a list of conditions that it presumes are related to military service. Um, we're gonna start with the, the burn pit and then we'll get, get into uh, the other segments about Asian Orange and then Camp Lejeune. So Jim, let's, let's help our audience, let's walk them through by understanding in terms of toxic exposure based on Middle East service, what, what does this mean in terms of where a veteran has served and whether or not they need to prove whether or not they were exposed to a specific toxic exposure? So, great question, Nate. The um, burn pits or Gulf War uh, service connection has is, is really been challenging over the last 30 years because the VA has addressed really only a handful of conditions and made it very, very difficult for veterans to prove that their uh, had conditions from toxic exposure. The VA has long realized that, uh, you know, these Gulf War veterans are coming back and having all kinds of medical issues, unexplained issues. And, but VA kind of, you know, didn't say, well, you know, we don't really know what it is. And, and they, they didn't really address them. With the PACT Act, they have addressed uh, a number of over 20 cancers, respiratory conditions. Here at Veterans Voices, we pride ourselves on exploring all aspects of military life. In our October show, we had an in-depth conversation with military chaplains. And in our A Veterans Voice segment, I was honored to talk with Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Noel Lepagna. Now I want to welcome to the show chaplains Carl Rhodes and Karen Meeker. Good evening, Stephen. Good evening, Good everyone. Evening. Good to see you. If each of you could give us a quick one minute introduction on your religious background and then your military career. Karen, why don't you go first? Great, thanks. Uh, it, it is great to be here with you all. And uh, Stephen, thank you for your service, uh, particularly in, in the Vietnam War. Uh, I'm, I'm pinch hitting this evening for General Waff, uh, who uh, sends regrets. He really wanted to be here tonight, but I'm thankful that uh, I get to uh, be here. Uh, thanks to all our veterans out there who are listening. Thank you for your service. I came in the United States Army from Pennsylvania, uh, discerned a call to serve in, in uh, the uniform of our Army uh, when I was uh, growing up in uh, Shikshini, Pennsylvania, and uh, uh, pursued that calling with my church in the United Methodist Church, who uh, endorses me today to be, to be a chaplain. I went to Bucknell and Harvard for my education. I've served with the 82nd Airborne Division, 101st, 2nd Infantry Division, and 1st Armored Division. Uh, served with Special Operations, and recently was in Korea during the pandemic. And I'm back now in Washington for the fourth time. Maybe I'll get it right this time. And uh, so that's a little synopsis of where I've been with the Army. And I think that's where transition is, was difficult for me. And I think it is for a lot of other veterans and finding that new identity because during my work study and, and doctoral work learned from my colleagues and the, the circles that I was in in the veteran community that the veteran transition process for individuals who are still too tightly tied to that ed military identity 
have a more difficult time going into you know uh, the civilian world and not that you have to completely shed that identity or lose those like you know to your point core values and and attributes that you've gained in the military but they just have to be transformed and kind of recalibrate it uh, a bit the changing face of the military includes an increasing number of women in november we were proud to host a panel of female veterans for our women in service show want to kind of pivot and talk about uh, with each of our veterans we asked you a prompting question at the very beginning before we started the show and we want to give each of you an opportunity to answer so we'll start with you patty and just ask you what was the most meaningful meaningful event of your military career um when i was giving in injections and getting people on medical readiness at a command after 9 11 um i wanted to relate to the younger veterans um, uh, the people that are, uh, the women that are here that are younger veterans or even younger and how to do that. And so one of the things I observed is they would take their blouse off so I could give them an injection. I had my own cage with all my stuff in there to do that and another uh, person in there to help me record. And I saw all these tattoos. And so I'm not kind of good into tattoos. I'm, I'm, nurses are weenies. We don't have to do <laughs> things to our bodies if we don't have to. And so I just started talking about it. I said, oh, that's really complex. I mean, how much you pay for that? I said, I don't think I'd be too cheap to pay some money. And it was a way to relate. And I'm finding out with younger vets and um, even in my own family as a, my dad, a vet, my husband, my brother, that sometimes they can't talk directly. And so how do you work around that? And so that was the conversation. And I wasn't there to have them come into my cage and pour everything out or try to take over some other role that somebody else was taking up in uh, the command I was in. But, you know, uh, at least they would ask me some health questions. They had some terrible notions about things. And then that was one of my finest moments. And I found out later that Contra Costa County, the library there has a veteran kind of uh, component to it. We hope you've enjoyed our best of 2022 show. Look for Veterans Voices to continue exploring topics important to our veterans community in 2023. Veterans Voices is brought to you in part by contributions from the Diablo Valley Veterans Foundation, dedicated to helping veterans near you. American Legion Post 246, honoring the tradition of the American Legion in Danville. If you would like to help sponsor Veterans Voices, you can donate to Veterans Voices care of Diablo Valley Veterans Foundation get in touch with them at DiabloVeterans.org. To rewatch tonight's episode, check back on our homepage later this week or check your cable provider schedule for rebroadcast times. You can also rewatch this episode and many others on our YouTube channel, Veterans Voices of Contra Costa. So be sure to subscribe. Our next show will air on Monday, January 9th at 7 p.m. You won't wanna miss it. To all of our veterans and their families, thank you for serving. To all of you who tuned in tonight, thanks for watching and have a great evening.